with Festive Road, and today I'm in conversation with Pat McDonough from Clarity. Hi, Pat, Caroline. Welcome. Good to see you as always. Thank you. So we're here talking about travel management today. Um, what specifically about a managed travel program is it that you'd like to talk about? Engagement. Oh, one of my favorites. Fabulous. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> engagement. So why have you chosen engagement? What specifically would you like to talk about? I think it's hugely underrated when travel managers think about their program. Um, I think a lot of businesses, a lot of clients are, are very good at telling people what to do. They're not very good at telling people why. Okay. Uh, internal communications and engagement with travel programs is really quite lacking a lot of the time. Um, people see it as, a, you know, I'm going to issue a directive, I'm going to tell people to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to tell them to do that, I'm going to enforce a policy here, a rate cap there, etc. But very, very seldomly people actually sit people down and say, these are the reasons why we're doing it. This is what it means in real terms for our business if we were to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm championing, really, getting engagement um, up to the top of the agenda in travel management and trying to get uh, engagement right the way through an organization as well. So I want travel managers, procurement category managers, to start to think about how they bring travel management, travel spend, onto the boardroom agenda in a way that drives engagement from top to bottom. Wow. I literally could say cut right now <laughs> and we're done. I am sold and converted. <laughs> That's a, I'd love to see that happen as well. So are you seeing within customers, like your own customer base or elsewhere, a, a, is hardly anyone doing this? What's stopping them from doing it? Are the employees of these companies expecting it? Because I feel there's a real talent shift of don't tell me what to do. Oh, yeah. I, like, it's my time. I'm the traveler, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll do what I want to. Yeah. No, but uh, actually, yeah, attitudes in the workplace have maybe changed. People are starting to think about things away from just the salary, looking at softer benefits. Uh, if they join a business and all of a sudden it's like, you must do this, you must stay there, you must do that, then they're going to struggle with that. So you have to sell the idea to people. You have to encourage responsibility in people, I guess, when it comes to the travel spend. Ultimately, you have to create travel programs that people want to adopt. Okay. And sometimes that requires some quite deep thinking about how you engage people with that process. So you might have in a company someone who's responsible for selling multi-million deals, has, I don't know, a large headcount, a large budget, and yeah. yet they can't book a trip that they want to spend an extra £20 on a different hotel choice or whatever. Yeah. So do, can you see a shift away from that and travel managers listening more and then they're going to need to update travel policies or... So I think there's, so engagement's an interesting one, right? Because mm. communication's one way and engagement's two way. Yeah. So is that something about travel managers needing to get better listeners? Oh yeah. So we talked yesterday, we were in a, a data session and we talked about how we highlight people who are maybe acting outside of the behaviors we want them to act outside of. And we called them repeat offenders, if okay. you like. And actually, when you think about people in, that, in those terms, your behavior towards that individual is only going to be one way. It's going to be this person stepping out of line, they're doing the wrong thing, I'm going to tell them what to do. And actually, you should be going to those people and saying, hey, noticed you're doing this, can we talk about it? Why is it taking place? Tell me about what it is about your role or your travel that means that you need to do this in a certain way. And I think the better you understand your end user, the more likely it is that they're actually going to engage with a program and you're going to deliver a program that suits them. Yeah. You know, that's, that's happened to me before when I was a travel buyer and I had that conversation with one of those repeat offenders Yeah. and it turned out he was training for a triathlon and he needed access to a pool Yeah. was why he kept going out of policy yeah. and absolutely we would encourage that because we wanted him to look after his health and his well-being oh, but actually we would potentially lose him as an employee yeah. if he wasn't able to continue training. I remember having a similar conversation, although I wasn't training for a triathlon, <laughs> with an old employer. We used to like to stay in a certain uh, village near to where we used to work. We used to work at Thomas Cook at the time. And uh, there was a directive that everybody had to stay in a certain hotel in the centre of Peterborough. Now, I was travelling down, I was staying two or three nights a week. Actually, that group of people who travelled with me kept me sane and we had a nice time in the evening and we, you know, really just kept each other going, if you yeah. like. Um, there was a threat that we wouldn't be able to do that anymore. You know, we'd be 
in the mixer with everybody else into into a you know a, a central hotel and actually some of that I guess some of the well-being aspects of it was being neglected and my position as an employee at the time was I travel for you every single week I'm making personal sacrifices at home and actually I'm not pre prepared to do this anymore if, if you're gonna ask me to yeah. do that conversation very quickly changed towards okay well you know on this occasion we're going to make this exception etc but I do think understanding those end users not because they're divas but because there are stories behind why people do these things and if you can do a little bit that makes a big difference to somebody you should do it so um, that position you were in and said I'm not going to do it because mm. I'm giving up my I'm I'm exactly the same right maybe you've reached a point in your career where you're comfortable to say no I am going to protect what I need yeah um, I, I feel some travel programs then fail the employee mm. by not recognizing that those decisions are theirs to take. Yeah. And it feels that there's this circular conversation about, well, it's the company's money, yeah. but it's the employee's time. Yeah. And so I, I'd love to see policies evolve to help understand that there is that balance. And maybe it's just the difference between someone that goes every week versus someone that take the new grad who goes on one trip a year. Yeah. Have you seen much of that of like different groups of people they separate out? There are a whole range of things though. If you think about, if, if somebody's treated well, they stay somewhere they like and they feel comfortable, what are you gaining in terms of discretionary effort from that person? Mm. Because they're comfortable where they're staying and they're actually happy to sit there and work because the environment's nice of an evening. Whereas you put them somewhere they don't particularly like, you, you, you lose that engagement with that person you actually could be costing your business an awful lot of money trying to save a few, a few quid. The other thing is that sometimes people actually go and indulge in maverick behaviours beyond simply not complying with the programme. They'll go outside of the programme completely. And when they start doing that, you're incurring additional costs of time and resources to see expense claims through. The spend potentially becomes invisible to you. You're not managing that anymore. You're losing leverage with hoteliers and perhaps airlines, etc. So you're starting to create a challenge for yourself simply because people aren't choosing to adopt the program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you just use the term discretionary effort, mm. and I always put the term engagement and discretionary effort together. I think we could probably go down to a whole employee engagement yeah. conversation now, yeah. right? Around if people feel engaged, then they will release that discretionary effort, mm. and I. I think the travel program exists on the edge of that, right? It's, it's quite fascinating. Mm. While we're talking about engagement, there's something here about travel buyer, travel manager skill set. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if there's something that's maybe missing that travel buyers don't feel it's a part of their job. I've written about this in the past and called it the selling buyer. Yeah. So I... And I've heard that a lot in the show about people saying the really successful buyers are those that can engage their external suppliers and help them understand their company and sell to them why Clarity should work with them because we're this, we're that. And they can really engage their suppliers and then engage their internal audience to say, here's why you need to use these suppliers. Here's mm -hmm. which is ultimately engagement as a whole. I wonder, is it just about a skill gap as to why that doesn't happen? I guess there's, there's, a, something else, I don't well, there's a variety of things. I think, I think actually, if you, if you just go out and ask a marketplace for X, Y, and Z and how much it is without engaging with that marketplace and you know, really getting into the detail behind the reasons why you want these things, rarely you're going to get what you're looking for. You're only going to get what you asked for. Yeah. I yep. think those two things are quite different. So I'll give a great example. We worked with an infrastructure company and, uh, and they had a, a group of people who were going to be working on a, a rail resignaling project um, in uh, a UK city over a number of weeks. And they said, we need a property. It must have X, Y and Z. So we said, OK, let's go and talk to the hoteliers. Well, no, we'll just look on the website. We can see what's got X, Y and Z. No, we'll go and talk to them. One hotelier actually put a laundry room in for them to actually deal with their requirements. So they had everything else, but they didn't have a laundry room. Right. They put one in for them. Nice. So that hotel have probably experienced that type of work before and exactly. know what the guests... Okay. Hoteliers benefited from it because they've understood the requirements and delivered to them. We benefited because we've made that happen. 
And of course, the clients benefited from it because they got a far better solution than they envisaged they were going to get in the first place. But that's because they went out and said, here's my problem, rather than give me this. Mm. The two things are really quite different. Yeah. So um, I think we're going to have to invite you back and do another interview because you've just made me think about moving from RFP territory into RFS, which is request for solution. Yeah. So RFP, you've got a set of specific questions yep. and you're encouraging a specific answer yeah. versus saying, here's us, here's what's important to our business. What do you think we should do? Yeah. Well, you Can know, you imagine? We, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. They, the client works a certain way. Sometimes that's imposed on them by their previous supplier and they're saying, you know, we need this, this and this. They may not need that, but they're not opening themselves up to a, an alternative solution. And actually, quite a lot of the time in that RFP process, it really is quite restrictive. You can't yeah. go outside of it. And when you do, you can be scored down because you, you, yeah, you're choosing yeah. to do it, you know, to, to offer something wow. different. So we love to get to the why, really. Okay. And I think actually when we think about engagement across the board, it's always why. Yeah. And I, I'm well positioned for that. I've got two toddlers ah, at home. I just thought of yeah. your children, just as and you it, said the word why. <laughs> I'm constantly answering that question. So for me to ask it to somebody else is... <laughs> you uh, quite enjoy it. Else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one closing question. Um, any advice that you've got for travel buyers wanting to really think about engagement in their programmes? Yeah, I think, look, we, we talk about our latest campaign is Change the Game. Change the game. What's that about really? It's about really elevating the conversation in the organization. So if you want to engage people, you need to start at the top. Yeah. You need to try and get people to buy into what you're doing. You need the support. You need the communication. It needs to be two-way. Yeah. And you've got to get to the end user and say, hey, why are we doing this? What are we looking for? How can we solve that challenge? Brilliant. Great summary. Thanks, as always. I could probably speak to you all afternoon and we'll just leave the camera rolling, but I'll let you go back to your business. Thank you so much for joining us, Pat. Thank, Thank you. you.